So it's the same faithful God that we're going to talk about here because this God who is faithful is a God who reveals Himself. And so I was thinking that we end our series in the book of Thessalonians 1 and 2, but I realized, wait a minute, you can't talk about the end times without talking about the revelation, right? It's so uh, half-hearted. So I decided to continue our series, The Return of the King, and uh, this time it's in the book of Revelation. So if you have your Bible, we will be in Revelation chapter 1. We will go through uh, not only chapter 1 today, but uh, we will have a, a review actually. So before that, as soon as you have your Bible open, I'm going to lead us in prayer. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for this moment. And thank you, Spirit of God, for revealing to us in a very special way what we need to know about you. Thank you for this place and we just thank you that we, we have a freedom today to study your word. We trust that you will, your word says that it will not come back to you void of its purpose. It will transform our lives today. In Christ's name, amen. So my goal today, as I mentioned, is not actually to go through uh, the chapter 1, but to give us an overview of the book of Revelation. So, overview this Sunday. Next Sunday is I want to give you a picture of heaven, what's going on in heaven while this is all things happening. That's in chapter 5. And then Finally, we'll just have three messages in the book of uh, Revelation, chapter 13. I want to give you a, a view of this uh, beast. So, basically, uh, the goal today is just an overview and in the process, clarifying the end times. What is going to happen. So, especially the reason why I don't want to spend too much in the middle of Revelation, because that's talking about the tribulation. And I'm not there when that happens, so I'm not planning to be there. So, but if you think you will be there during that time, feel free to dig in further into the book of Revelation. So, let me start with this. Understanding the book of Revelation is not uh, an easy thing. So, if you notice, two Sundays ago, Pastor Ben preached on the tribulation. Remember that? It was in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And you notice that I disappeared during the tribulation message. <laughs> no, it was, the rapture did not happen. As you can see, I'm still here. But uh, this is a, a very important uh, message for us to know as followers of Jesus. But the reason why the book of Revelation is so hard to understand is because it's called an apocalyptic language. Apocalyptic means really what it means, revelation or unveiling. And so the language, uh, that genre requires a lot of symbolism and numbers and uh, all the things that uh, needs to come with that uh, genre. So as an example, okay, so the reason why it's so hard to understand Revelation is like this. Sometimes I think it's like learning the English language. Okay, so learning the English language, there are things that I find so hard, like the idiomatic expression. Things that it doesn't sound, what it, it doesn't mean what it sounds or what it reads. So I think we find it so hard to understand because of uh, the language. It's a different language. You know, for example, learning English, you, last uh, Sunday someone uh, invited us for dinner. And it was so good, it was seafood dinner. And it was like, so there was salmon, there was uh, squid, uh, you know, barbecue grilled squid. There was also uh, some uh, dried fish. And there was like, you know, shrimp in mongo, so all these things. So it was so good. 
And literally I could have said I was fed up after the dinner. I, oh, thank you, I was so fed up. <laughs> but in the English language, when you say I was fed up, it means you are upset, you are annoyed. Doesn't mean you are a fool. See how all the, the difference in the English language. Another example, you know, we, we talk about, we don't talk about showering the plants or taking a bath the plants. <laughs> what do we say? We, we water, right? Yeah. We don't take a bath the plants. <laughs> so all these uh, different things that we have, it's similar, you know, it's learning another language and that's what the book of Revelation is all about. So, uh, it is a book written by Apostle John, but the real author is Jesus Christ. You can see chapter 1, verse 1. There's a re revelation from Jesus Christ. And it was written by John while he was in the island, exiled in the island of Patmos. Unfortunately, our group arrived in Patmos last year uh, when it was already dark. So we didn't really get to enjoy, but the year, the previous visit that I did, it was during the day. So when you get to visit that place again, it's actually a beautiful island. It's just a tiny island. So John wrote that as, the, as Christ revealed to him. He was, of course, exiled in the island of Patmos uh, under uh, the emperor Titus uh, Flavius Diocletian. <laughs> you got that? In 94 AD for refusing to worship the emperor. So, but the book of Revelation, here's how you understand it. Okay, very simple. So today, remember, we're just going to do a review and in the process understand the end times. But I will close with what do we do while we wait for this end time. So very easy to understand this book of Revelation. If you know, you get it from verse 19. It goes in verse 19 like this. Right therefore, this is a message uh, from from Jesus, write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. So the points today is basically, I'm just going with that. Underline, what you have seen, number one, what is now, number two, and what will take place later, number three. So let's check it out. What you have seen. According to chapter 1, he saw the risen Christ. It says in verse 17 to 18, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. So remember, this is around 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus. So Jesus still shows up to people. In fact, he showed up one, one day, he showed up to Apostle Paul. You read this in chapter 9. He was just going about his business, which is to uh, uh, persecute Christians. And then... Uh, Jesus showed up and he showed up to uh, John, Apostle John and he still shows up today. So the central person really of the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ. And uh, so you can say that the book of Revelation is a hymn book. Why? Because it's about him. It's about, <laughs> it's about him, about Jesus Christ. You know, when Christ first came, He came to redeem the world. But when He comes the second time, He comes to reign. First time He came uh, for crucifixion, the second time for coronation. First time He came on a tree, the second time He will be on the throne. And so the purpose of this book is really in verse 1, to show us the servant, the things that must take place shortly. And look at it in verse 3. If you read verse 3, it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy 
and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So there is blessing actually in learning the book of Revelation. So as I mentioned to earlier, Jesus shows up to people. He showed up to Apostle Paul. He showed up to, uh, to John. He still shows up today. In fact, if you read the story in uh, the Muslim world, um, sometimes you get confused like the, the, uh, the people and the religion. The Muslim are the people who has the belief of Islam. It's like the Christians are the people who believe Christianity or the Jews. Uh, so there's so in the Muslim world, Jesus shows up because most of the time the only way to convince a Muslim about Jesus Christ is for Jesus to show up. To give you an example. Okay, so this. This guy named uh, Muhammad, uh, well that's his last name, Bashir Muhammad, and his wife. He is now, I don't know if you can see, it's purposely dark and kind of uh, back for a purpose. So, uh, this guy is now leading a Bible study, not hosting, sorry, hosting a Bible study in his home. But, Six years ago, he was actually fighting, fighting in uh, the this this group uh, Nusra Front, an offshoot of Al Qaeda. But now he is hosting a Bible study. He is, he says he says that a jihadi he is turned who turned to Jesus, and so he said that one day he saw his colleagues ex executing several captives by crushing them with a bulldozer. But in early 2015, his wife fell very ill. And as her health worsened, Mr. Muhammad described her condition in a phone call with his cousin. Okay, so his cousin, while growing up, brings this guy to uh, what he calls the uh, uh, jihadist lectures as teenager. So fast forward later, he called his cousin who brought him to this lecture, but he is now living in Canada. And uh, basically he calls, and I don't want to mention his name in Canada, but because it's the same name that I know. But he, he goes like this. So he calls his cousin about the news of his wife. And lo and behold, he finds out that this cousin living in Canada also converted to Christianity. So the cousin said that uh, you should put the phone on the ear of your wife so my prayer group can pray. So initially he refused that because he thinks Christianity is so repellent. But he was so desperate. So finally he gave in, got the phone over to his wife. The cousin and the prayer group prayed. And uh, he says this, that in the prayer, not only the healing of the wife, but even continues because Mr. Muhammad and his wife Rashid saw Jesus in their dreams. Because it's so hard to convince. Because here's what it is difficult to convince whether a Jew or a Muslim to convert to Christianity is because how can this God of the universe become human being? That is the gap there. So, but Jesus showed up. Muhammad said he showed up first to his wife in a biblical figure about a heavenly powers dividing the waters of the sea. And he interpreted this as a sign of encouragement. Then he showed up to Muhammad's dream. And the dream is that Jesus had given him some chickpeas. Now we may not understand what that means, 
But uh, if you check in Islam, it means a person will obtain wealth after much grief and sorrow. So they really felt love. And he goes like this. He says this, that there is now uh, a big gap between the God I used to worship and the one I worship now. He goes, but this comes with a price because his rejection of Islam makes him a target from his friends and allies that he used to fight with. But he said, you know, I trust God who can protect me and that's what I can do. So the point is that Jesus showed up to John, he showed up to Pete, to uh, Paul, and he showed up to not, this is only one of the examples. In fact, I know this is on video, but this is okay. In fact, the Christian and Missionary Alliance, our denomination, have started churches in the Middle East. And we hear stories. And obviously we can't say all the details, but we hear stories of changed lives. Of thousands of, Islamic, uh, of uh, people of Islamic faith converting to Christianity because of what ISIS has done. So what ISIS has done has actually encouraged people to turn to Christianity. So the point is that Jesus is alive. He shows up to people. If you have not heard from Jesus lately, maybe you say, you know what, I, how come I've never heard from Jesus? You know what, I hear from Him every morning when I read the Bible. That means you haven't read your Bible. Because God speaks to us through His, through His Word. And there are many ways that Jesus speaks to me as well. So that's the point of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation reminds us that Jesus is alive and well. Thank you very much. Here's the second one. What is now? So what was what he saw at that moment was that Jesus is alive. What is now is really he's talking about the seven churches of Asia. Now it says, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lamps is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. That's a lot of seven. So basically, the seven in the scripture represents completeness, perfection. And so when it says, that, so basically in this, when you read the seven lampstands, it's talking about the seven churches of Revelation. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Theatra, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. It's talking about that. And the seven stars is talking about the angels for these churches. And so the symbolism of seven is not because it's completeness, it's talking about the churches for the ages, including us, New Life Alliance Church. So this is a symbol of completeness about the local body of Christ of all believers throughout the ages. So let me just give you this uh, about the book of Revelation. You can see chapter 2 and 3, a lot of sevens here. The seven churches, 6 to 8, the seven seals, 8 to 10, the seven trumpets, 15 to 16, the seven bowls, and 17 to 19, the collapse of the world market, and then the millennium. Jesus reigns for 1,000 years in chapter 20, and the great white throne judgment, and then the new heaven and the new earth. That is a lot of seven. But in the scripture, Seven is a perfection, a number of perfection. So the, what I'm trying to illustrate the next, this time, is I want to illustrate to you that these places in the Bible can be experienced. As I mentioned to you, we, we were in Patmos. But also we were in Ephesus. 
So in fact, in Ephesus, is one in one of the churches I was able to uh, to uh, share my uh, devotional there about the church in Ephesus. And so these places uh, are we can experience these places. They exist. They are there. We just need to get there. <laughs> Getting there can be a challenge. But there are airplanes, so that's easier. So that is what is now. So basically, in the book of Revelation, it's just three phases. What he has seen, he saw Jesus Christ alive. What uh, what is now, they're talking about the seven churches existing at that time. There are more churches, obviously, but there are a focus, there was a focus on the seven churches in Asia. Asia Minor, okay, not Asia as in uh, the continent. Asia Minor, like uh, Turkey, all these uh, places there. And uh, the, the third that he wants us to understand is what will take place later, the end times. And this is what we've been talking about the last few Sundays. What will take place later, which means the end times. So if you remember, after I read this verse, I'm going to do the human PowerPoint just to remind us. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So chapter 4 to the end is really what must take place after this. So remember this human PowerPoint. The end time, where, where does it begin? The end time. As we have discussed. You remember? It begins from here. What? what? <coughs> the rapture, right? The Toronto rapture will be here. So the rapture begins. So re let me remind you of the power, human PowerPoint. So this is the end time, the stage, for those of you who missed it. This, the moment of the rapture, which is chapter 4 and 5 of 1 Thessalonians. So after the rapture, the seven years of tribulation begins. And I'll mention where all these uh, are mentioned in the Bible. The seven year beginning. And that is the... Uh, so where is the church? According to Paul in First Thessalonians 4 and 5. Where is the church during the tribulation? Well it says that we will meet Jesus in the air to be with Him. So if you re realize at the rapture according to Paul, okay, Jesus is not descending completely but we go up to see so meaning when the seven year begin we are not here the seven year tribulation begins with peace but it's fake peace because at the moment uh, he can solve all the problems in the world make peace between the Jews and the Palestinians and all the other things I'm talking about the Antichrist the man of lawlessness, as was mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which was two Sundays ago. But it's fake peace, because as soon as people enjoy and love all these things that are happening that he's doing, three and a half years later into that, and I'll show you in the scripture where it's found. Three and a half years later, he starts implementing his plan. His plan was or is to be worshipped as God in the temple. And so that is uh, the moment that you cannot buy and sell unless you have the mark of the beast, the Bible says. And so this is three and a half years later, after the tribulation. And so after the, the three and a half years, it's still possible to become followers of Jesus, of course, but it's so hard because of restrictions. After the seven years is the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Millennium means 1,000, and that is the beginning where Christ comes and reigns for 1,000 years. Now, let me explain uh, this, because I put it in the PowerPoint here. The rapture, 
1 Thessalonians 4.17, as I mentioned, and Revelation 4.1. In 4.17, it uses the word cut up together in the air. In Revelation 4.1, it uses the word come up here. Those are rapture words. As a reminder, there is no word rapture in the Bible. It is the original word of that is uh, Latin, but there is no rapture. So the word rapture is not Greek nor English. Originally, it's Latin, but that's the translation in Latin. The cut up here, the come up here. And so after that is the tribulation, as I mentioned. And uh, halfway through the tribulation, the reason why we say it's seven years, okay? Because in Daniel 9.27, it says like this. Listen to this. He's talking about the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. He says, Daniel says, He will confirm a covenant with many the peace for one seven. In the middle of the seven, three and a half years, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out to him. So you can't talk about the end times without discussing Daniel and Revelation. These are end time apocalyptic uh, books of the Bible. So the uh, halfway through, it's also mentioned in uh, Revelation because it says right there, it says that the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for how many months? 42 months. How many years is that? If you're paying your car three years, that's 36 months. <laughs> your car loan. That's three and a half years. So Daniel mentioned that. Revelation mentioned that. Uh, so and then of course there is the Armageddon and then the destruction of the beast and then the second coming and millennial reign of Christ. So I need to be quick on this because I don't want this to be like a, a classroom. But you need to know this that there is two other views, okay, so I mentioned to you that Christ comes and reigns for 1,000 years. That view is called premillennialism, premillennialism, because Christ comes before the millennium. But there are views out there that is called postmillennialism, meaning that post is after, right? So meaning the... Uh, coming of Christ is after the 1,000 years. So 1,000 years happened, Christ comes. So post is after or late. That's why my mail is always late, because they're coming from the post office. No, I'm just <laughs> if you work in the post office, that was a joke. Okay, so, but there is another, you need to say some kind of uh, thing, this is so serious, okay, this is so serious, right? The, uh, there's another view that is called amillennialism, meaning a means nothing, zero. So basically, or it's not, so basically that view is that Christ will not come physically for 1,000 years. So there is amill, there is postmill, postmail, no, not postmail, postmill. And there is a pre mill. Now, pre mill is called a historical view because it was known as the view of a lot of church fathers and supported with a lot of scriptures. So I always reveal myself I am a pre mill person because I like to eat meals. <laughs> pre mill means that I believe the Bible says that he comes. Jesus dies and reigns physically on earth for 1,000 years. But you don't have to follow my premium. You can study the scripture and decide for yourself. So, and then, uh, let me just clarify one thing. Because there's a confusion about, if you notice that, here's the rapture and here's the second coming. 
The rapture is not the second coming of Christ. These are different events. For example, the rapture, Christ comes for His church. The second coming, Christ comes with His church. So that's the difference. And then also the rapture, Jesus will not descend to earth completely, but in the second coming, He descends to reign for a thousand years, the earthly reign. And also the rapture, here's the thing, the rapture could happen at any moment. Like right now, as we are talking. But the second coming will happen after the tribulation, the seven years. So think about that. Where do you stand as a follower of Jesus? Because I know it's apocalyptic, end time stuff. If the Bible is true, and if my belief and my interpretation of the Bible is true, that the rapture is true, then can you imagine? Nina and I, just imagine this, okay? Nina and I are flying to the Philippines in this, not 737 MAX, because it's grounded, <laughs> in this 777 Boeing. And then, there are all these, I don't know, 400 people. And imagine this with me. The rapture takes place. And the pilot is a Christian. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm a Christian, so I'm okay. I have all these, ima so many imaginations, right? Because this is the reality, according to the scripture. So then we need to take this to heart. Because what will really take place, according to the scripture, if we believe that, is as we have summarized today. So I want to end with this. So what do we do until then? Do we just kind of stand around and fiddle our fingers and hope the best? Knock on wood? That's all they say while they wait, right? Well, three things. We need to live a life that pleases God now. To prepare for His coming. That's one of the things we need to do. We need to prepare for His coming by living a life that pleases Jesus. Second thing. We need to witness to our friends, to our brothers, to our co-workers. Before we get into this airplane with a Christian pilot. <laughs> because what will happen when Christ comes and they are not followers of Jesus? They don't know salvation. So that's a very important for us to bring them to Jesus. Co-workers, friends, families, neighbors. And lastly, we need to worship with other believers to keep the flame burning. You know, if we stop coming to church and stop attending our life groups and our discipleship, just watch other followers of Jesus. You know, I meet with people like that. You know, I'm getting cold in my faith. Well, you know this that it will happen because they're moving away from getting together. There's a reason why the Bible reminds us to not stop gathering. Hebrews 10, 25. And that's one of them. It's because we need to keep this flame burning. Because Christians are like charcoals. So say to yourself, you are a charcoal. No, don't say you are. You say I am. <laughs> a charcoal, once you remove one piece from the fire, it will slowly die. The flame will slowly die. And so we need to keep meeting together. 
and not stop meeting together as some may be in the habit of doing. And so that's the encouragement. While we wait, we live a life worthy of God. We witness to our, bro to our brothers, to our friends and co-workers and family, and we keep worshiping the Lord with other believers. Amen.